Hello, everyone. Um, this is Milton speaking to you from Hong Kong, together with uh, Seth Sohm in Tel Aviv. We are presenting this question and answer period um, from following our IVF Worldwide uh, online conference. Now, we had a very successful uh, IVF Worldwide online conference on April the 25th. And we have over 13,000 attendees from 150 countries. So it was a very successful meeting. And I would like to thank you. We would like to thank you for joining us for this event. We would like to thank our Congress sponsors who generally supported us, Platinum sponsor Abbott, and Gold sponsors GE Healthcare, Ferramax, Vitro Life, and Cooper Surgical. We would also like to thank the Congress Organizing Committee, David Albertini from USA, Norbert Gleiker, USA, Antonio Palliser from Spain, Sherman Silver from USA, Evelyn Telfer from the UK, Elder Weisman from Israel, Yuval Yaron from Israel, and John Jiang from USA. We would, of course, also thank our Congress speakers, you know, who gave us their time and who gave us, you know, wonderful lectures that you have all enjoyed. I would like to personally congratulate Joel Ferreira, who is the winner of the iPad. And with this iPad, he has access to the Journal of Fertilization, our journal in IVF worldwide. Due to popular demand, we will be holding a second raffle, and you can sign up the same way by clicking the sign in the exhibition area. The speaker of today's question and answer session will be Robert Fischer from Germany, Ariel Weisman from Israel, Filippo Ubaldi from Italy, Rito San from USA, Norbert Gleiger from USA, and John Jovich from Australia. Professor Som. Thank you, Milton. I hope that by now everybody will manage to get his certificate of attendees of the meeting and those who wanted to get their CME points. And we will immediately start with the questions and answers section and we'll start with Robert Fisher. And thank you very much, Milton, for this introduction. And we will meet again at the end of the session. <clears throat> Hi, Robert. Thank you for coming back to us. Uh, following your presentation, we received a lot of questions, and we would like uh, to ask you to answer some of them. I grouped the questions into different topics that I think that you can respond to. But before we go into the questions, can you please summarize your presentation in two to three sentences so it will introduce us to the questions that I will uh, then ask you. Well, hello, um, Zev, and it's a pleasure to be back and also will be a pleasure to answer the questions. I understand that there have been many of them. And uh, to summarize uh, my presentation, I would say the new stratification according to Poseidon Group is moving uh, from just a mathematical point of view of a few number of oocytes, which have been uh, the characteristic of a poor responder in the past, to uh, describe this patient as more poor prognosis patient, as uh, not only the number of the oocytes, but also the age of the patient and the potential of the patient according to her ovarian reserve plays a role. Uh, according to this Poseidon criteria, we in implemented 
um, ovarian reserve uh, markers with the age of the patient to divide the patient in four different groups. And the end uh, point of a stimulation, according to this uh, uh, new stratification, will be the number of oocytes that are needed uh, in a stimulation or in a stimulation strategy to achieve at least uh, one uh, euploid embryo for embryo transfer as a, the end point of uh, treatment. And uh, using a calculator that has been developed by the Poseidon group, uh, one can um, put into the calculator system all details on uh, the patient ovarian reserve, um, what is the maturation rate and of the oocyte in the center, uh, the blastulation rate, uh, euploidity rate, what kind of sperm is used, and all this information uh, can help us to calculate the number of oocytes needed to a certain given person uh, to achieve this goal of uh, achieving at the end one euploid embryo for the transfer. And many of you have asked me what is the website uh, uh, of the Poseidon group. Uh, and on the screen you can see now uh, the website of the Poseidon group where you can uh, join uh, this website and register and not only use the calculator, which you are very welcome to do, but also enjoy uh, all the information on the Poseidon group, uh, publications that have been published, and ongoing uh, studies using the Poseidon criteria for scientific purposes. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. So let's ask with the questions. Most of the questions asking about the protocol that you are using. And in order to get some of the answers, I will direct you through these questions to see if we can finalize the protocol. And the first questions came from the United Kingdom and Malaysia. And they are asking, would you consider using clomiphen citrate with 75 units of FSH uh, to develop single follicle, and another one, any benefits in adding clomiphene or letrozole to FSH or LH? So basically, are we using clomid or letrozole in the stimulation protocol in these patients? Well, um, as uh, you understand, uh, the four groups of the Poseidon group are uh, different uh, by the characteristics. Uh, the only group uh, which is the most difficult group is uh, group number four, which are the older patients uh, with a very low ovarian reserve and, of course, a low number of oocytes, and they also have a very uh, poor euploidity rate of the oocytes. Now, in this patient, uh, anything uh, you can do in order to achieve um, enough oocytes uh, will be welcome. Uh, concerning uh, using uh, gonadotropins, uh, seems that uh, giving not more than 300 units of gonadotropins uh, will not uh, make any difference. So gonadotropins should be at the highest level of 300 units of FSH. Now, in those cases, as I mentioned already in uh, uh, my lecture, if you are not achieving more than one follicle giving such a high dose of gonadotropins and only one follicle will repeatedly come up, then it is not necessary to give such expensive uh, medication because it's a burden to the patient. And in order to facilitate the situation, you can use either clomid or you can use letrozole or a modified natural cycle in order to achieve this one follicle, and you can repeat it a few times to collect uh, enough number of uh, fertilized oocytes and embryos. So everything that will reduce the burden. But if there is a possibility to have more than one uh, follicle, then of course, uh, using recombinant FSH with recombinant LH, and in this subgroup of patient, recombinant LH seems to be helpful to have a better competence of the oocyte. Thank you. So there is another group of people who are actually asking about 
how do you supplement recombinant FSH or FSH and with what? And there are questions from Anika from Nigeria, Abida from Malaysia, Katonia from Russia, and Mustafa from Lebanon. And I will read you just the questions so you'll be able to answer. Um, for poor responders, can you stimulate using both FSH and HMG? How much of LH would you start with? Do you recommend androgen before progesterone, before, uh, uh, before uh, stimulating uh, the patients? Do you recommend the use of HMG, then recombinant FSH in bed responders? Well, in uh, the Poseidon group, we are speaking about poor prognosis patients. And uh, the group one and group two are actually patients who have good ovarian reserve, but unexpectedly they produce less uh, oocytes than expected according to the number of the antral follicles. So these patients uh, usually have either an FSH receptor problem uh, or an LH uh, receptor problem or uh, they have uh, the so-called uh, variant LH uh, mutation of the molecule. And in those patients, uh, increasing the dose of the FSH to what has been used before by at least 75 units and adding 75 units of LH uh, is uh, advisable because that will correct the hypo response. And um, in uh, those patients who need uh, 300 units of FSH, then 150 units of LH uh, uh, will be beneficial. Uh, HMG will not be helpful because HMG does not uh, include LH. Um, the LH, which was supposed to be in the urinary product, is uh, eliminated by the high uh, purification uh, system and uh, the loss of the LH molecule is compensated by the companies with HCG. And HCG is very different uh, from LH because HCG is uh, a more stereogenic uh, factor uh, when it's uh, attaching to the uh, cell membrane, to, an, uh, to the receptor, and uh, it has no effect on uh, development and maturation of the follicle. Uh, and it is also pro-apoptotic. On the other side, uh, LH uh, is uh, less steroidogenic than, H than HCG, but uh, it has a very positive effect of the phosphoact and phosphoerc uh, pathways in the cell, and um, there will be a much better development, and it is anti-apoptotic. So LH is uh, beneficial to have a better quality of oocytes. And studies have been shown that uh, in hyporesponder patients uh, to uh, rescue the hyporespond, giving HMG was not successful as giving LH uh, to rescue the cycle. And there are many studies uh, that have done, uh, been done in the past. Now, uh, group uh, three, uh, is a patient with a uh, very low um, uh, ovarian reserve, but she's young. Uh, so this patient, uh, uh, FSH uh, in a higher dose is uh, recommended. And the number of oocytes that will be needed in this group of patients is not so very high because the euploidity is usually about 50%. So even with a low number of oocytes, you can reach one euploid embryo at the blastocyst stage. Uh, in this subgroup, uh, the SPART study have shown uh, that the addition of recombinant LH did not change uh, the outcome of the treatment. So in this group, giving recombinant LH, unless they also have on top of it uh, a receptor problem of the FSH or the LH receptor, it will not be beneficial. In the group four uh, Poseidon, which are the older patients with a lo low ovarian reserve, LH ad added to FSH will be again beneficial because the SPART group showed that in the severe Bologna criteria group, the live birth rate was higher when recombinant LH was added to recombinant FSH, and the miscarriage rate was significantly lower. So this group of patients will benefit of adding LH two to one 
um, to addition to recombinant FSH. So according to, to which group of the four Poseidon uh, certification groups the patient will belong, uh, the stimulation will be accordingly managed. Thank you. Thank you very much for this ex explanation. There is another question coming from Israel, from Iran Zilberg, and he's asking, is the group of POF, in the group of the POF, what are the chances of prematulotinization while not using agonist or antagonist? Well, uh, we know that uh, in uh, patients who are with very, very low ovarian reserve, uh, the whole uh, process of follicular maturation uh, is very accelerated because of the high FSH uh, at the end of the luteal phase. Uh, so you start with quite large follicles at the beginning of the cycle. They are unsynchronized completely. And also the follicular development is uh, very accelerated. So if one will not use a um, long agonist protocol or antagonist, the probability of having a premature luteinization will be very high. And I forgot to answer uh, one of your questions in the question before concerning the androgen pretreatment. I'm sorry about that. Uh, I will uh, complete it now. Um, there have been uh, some studies to show that there is some benefit uh, using androgens uh, in the pretreatment. Although all the meta-analysis up to now have used very low numbers uh, of uh, patients who, and there was huge difference in the amount and the length of the pretreatment. Usually the pretreatment was too short. So as you heard, uh, yes, on, uh, on the last Saturday in some of the explanation, uh, using uh, androgens uh, beneficially one has to start two to three months before because then it's uh, helping in reducing the atresia of the follicles who start from the primordial follicles. Later on, it will only have an effect on the uh, uh, immediate uh, recruitment because the uh, androgens will increase the sensitivity of the granulosa cell receptors to FSH. But, uh, you're reducing uh, the number of atretic uh, follicle during the maturation, one has to start two to three months before. And none of these studies have done that. At the moment, there is one big study which is uh, uh, run by Nikos Politsos from uh, Spain. And uh, it is uh, for Bologna criteria patient. And it is uh, powered to show uh, if there is a benefit. And they start quite early with the testosterone and it is a multi-center study, and they did not finish to recruit, I think, uh, all the needed patients because they need about 450 patients in each site to show an effect. So unless we have uh, the information from this randomized study, we cannot say uh, that we need uh, to use in this uh, patient uh, uh, androgens, and uh, all the information up to now is very moderate, if not very poor, uh, due to the very low numbers in the meta-analysis. Right, so do you, personally, do you give androgens to this group of patients? Well, we don't, we don't need, uh, we don't give androgens uh, because I'm just waiting for the result. And when I, once I am uh, convinced by the result that it is helpful, I will do that because androgens will also have some side effects and uh, it is a long time that they need to take it. And in some of the patients, uh, it is quite difficult um, to use it unless we are sure that there will be a benefit. Right. There is another question from Spain, from Maria Oscavia, and she is actually asking, in your opinion, what is the best prognostic indicator for oocyte quality? Well, the best prognostic indicator is probably the age because the age will affect many aspects of the quality of the oocyte. And I'm not talking only on the uh, quality of the nucleus, which will be the nucleidity rate. And uh, this is, uh, have been shown also in my study that it is very much connected uh, to the age of the patient, but also the cytoplasmic maturity and molecular uh, maturity of the oocytes. As we know that 
age uh, will reduce the mitochondrial function uh, in the cytoplasma. Also, other uh, components of the cytoplasma are affected. And we know that a lot of growth factors are implemented with, uh, and uh, reduced uh, uh, by the age uh, of, of the patient. So the, the receptors are also uh, Teca cell receptors, LH receptors, the LH by itself uh, is uh, diminishing its bioactivity. So a lot of things happen and they end up uh, with uh, reducing the quality of the oocytes. And the last question coming from Dr. Fan from Vietnam, and they ask, should, are you doing PGTA in your old patient, especially those above the age of 38? So let well, us know if in general you are doing PGTA, yeah. if you think there is a place for this, if it's improved pregnancy rate. Well, it will not improve the pregnancy rate because you cannot change the oocytes. <clears throat> And, um, and you cannot change the embryos. In uh, Germany, we are not allowed to do PGTA on the embryo. We, and that's why we do polar body uh, genetic testing for aneuploidy. We use the first and the second polar body. And we recommend it to patients over the age of 38, because in this group of patients, uh, the uh, euploidity rate of the oocytes uh, will be quite low. And uh, they are just losing time by using embryos which are unuploid. So if the embryo will be monosomic, uh, it will not implant. So they will just, if they have more, uh, they will just freeze uh, unuseful embryos and lose time. And if it's a trisomic embryo, it will cause a miscarriage. So they will lose time again. So the biggest benefit of uh, doing a PGTA or polar body testing for unuploidity for this group of patients is just to reduce the time to pregnancy because you are not wasting time with embryos which are not useful. Uh, we are very happy to use the polar body testing because the biggest uh, problem in the advanced maternal age is the oocyte. It's a bigger problem than the sperm. The nucleidity of the sperm is very low and uh, postmitotic uh, occurrences are between 5 to 10 percent but 80 to 90% of aneuploidity of an embryo uh, comes uh, from the oocyte. So if the polar body shows that the oocyte is aneuploid, we have shown in the past, it will not repair itself. It will stay like that. So it's beneficial for this group of patients. Thank you, Robert. It was very, very interesting. Just, uh, just one uh, uh, thing I forgot uh, also in one of your questions you asked, if high doses of FSH or giving LH will change uh, the euploidity of the oocyte, right. it will not change. There are many studies to show that uh, high doses or independent doses of FSH or whatever you use cannot affect the euploidity of the oocyte. Sorry for not mentioning that before. It's fine. Thank you very much. It was really very interesting. Thank you for coming back to us today. And I'm sure that people will enjoy very much the answer, question and answers and your explanation. So again, thank you very much. Thank you, Zef. Always a pleasure to serve. Yes. So we have now Professor Aurel Weissman. And before we go to the questions, I asked him to summarize his talk and to bring back the conclusion slides to go to the conclusion and then we will go to the questions. So, Ariel, please. Okay, thank you, Zev. So, the topic of my lecture was when to stop treatment. And uh, we, show, we, we saw in the lecture that in terms of the patient's perspective, there are fairly high dropout rates, about uh, 25%, even from fully reimbursed programs. And those uh, dropouts are mainly related to the burden of treatment and not so much to financial consideration and also not to medical consideration because the dropout rates according to physicians' advice are only uh, 10%. So th there's definitely a gap that needs to be taken care of. And in terms of uh, the medical advice that should be given to patient, 
uh, what we were uh, referring to was that uh, every clinic needs good clinic specific tools in order to counsel patients regarding a, a dropout and uh, that a uh, there is strong data to support the efficacy of extending the number of IVF cycles beyond three or four, much beyond three or four, at least for couples uh, that are younger than 42 years. Above 42, uh, the number of cycles should be limited. Uh, the efficiency of IVF with a low number of oocytes is rather low and the combination of advanced maternal age and a low number of all sites is even less favorable. And we also saw that uh, neither AMH nor the development of blastocyst should be used as a, a predictor of uh, live births. And uh, I think that uh, uh, both of them should not preclude patients uh, from continuing uh, IVF. That means extremely low or even undetectable AMH or failure to produce blastocyst in a cycle. So that summarizes uh, my talk. And now I will be happy to answer uh, the questions. Thank you, Ariel. And the first question is coming from Alicia from Li Ling, and he asking, do you recommend patients to continue the next treatment cycle in the following month or rest for a few months before starting the new treatment cycle? So uh, continuing the uh, cycle in the next month is called a uh, back-to-back cycle. And there are very few studies, uh, but uh, both these studies and my uh, personal experience support uh, the uh, efficiency of back-to-back -back cycles. I mean, there's no reason to wait if uh, even now we're doing a dual steam, we're doing two stimulations in one cycle, then uh, we can start immediately in the next cycle unless there is a cyst formation and the ovaries have not returned yet to their uh, original size. This is a, a, what we demand to see, but we don't need uh, to stop between cycles. Thank you. The next question is coming from Ghana by Osi Nana Yu. And the question is, even though stopping treatment should be patient-centered, is there a cut off age even with the use of donor? A 68 year old woman delivered twins in Nigeria recently. Yes, so I think that uh, uh, every clinic and even country uh, has should have guide, strict guidelines about the age limit. And uh, in Israel, the limit uh, uh, for treatment for donor eggs is 54, which is uh, slightly higher than the average age of uh, menopause. So this this is uh, what we keep. So this is also uh, what I follow and what I recommend. Thank you. A question from India by Atam Samiri. What is the role of LH measurement on the day of egg retrieval? Well, okay, so uh, uh, there, are, uh, there are two possible roles. One, of course, is to see that uh, uh, the patient has not uh, started an uh, LH search. This is very obvious. But, uh, when, uh, uh, but the other thing I must refer to is uh, to antagonist cycles and uh, GnRH agonist trigger. Uh, it appears that uh, in patients that uh, are about to be triggered with an agonist, if uh, LH levels are extremely low and they are uh, beyond a certain limit or undetectable, then the agonist trigger will not be e efficient and the, the patient will have what is, is, is called the empty follicle syndrome. So this is a one a point where LH levels make a difference, okay? Thank you. A question from Peru by Maria Jose. Why is recommended to transfer 
in day three in women over 40 years? Uh, well, it is not a strict recommendation, but uh, also the paper that I was uh, referring to in my uh, lecture, when uh, in patients with advanced maternal age, if they have a low number of uh, embryos, then uh, it is uh, not always advisable to wait for blastocyst development and you may transfer at cleavage stage at day two and, or day three, because uh, these embryos, because of the quality of the oocytes are already in stress. And it could be that the in vitro conditions, even though we have now uh, excellent labs, uh, the in vitro conditions would not support uh, the, development, the development of those embryo uh, to blastocyst uh, in vitro. Well, if you transfer in vivo, you may get uh, pregnancies. And actually, the paper that I have shown, the, the Australian paper, this was a retrospective uh, study, but fairly large, showed double uh, pregnancy and, uh, and, and ongoing pregnancies, clinical pregnancies and ongoing pregnancies with the transfer of uh, cleavage states versus a, a blastocyst a transfer in patients uh, with, with advanced maternal age and a presence in presence of a single embryo. So I think it, it should be individualized. If a patient has a lot of embryos and they are of good quality, it makes sense to wait, to wait for the blastocyst. But if there are just a few embryos, then uh, you may transfer them at cleavage stage. Thank you, Ariel. And a, another question from Armenia. Do you suggest flare-up protocol for poor reserve patients? Well, there is not a single protocol which is a, a, which, which would be the best for those uh, low responders. And a, a flare-up protocol uh, is always an option. It is also, it's, it is also an option. And it may be a problem because flare-up protocol normally have to be, there has, there has to be a preparation with an oral contraceptive. And some patients, those with really a poor um, ovarian reserve, they may be uh, very suppressed after cessation of the oral contraceptive, and it may be difficult for them to respond. And they may be, they may do better on an antagonist protocol. But uh, a flare protocol is, is acceptable, but it is not necessarily the protocol of choice. Thank you. And a question from India by Dr. Richa. When to cancel IVF cycle after how many days of gonadotrophins? Okay, so uh, there is no specific uh, uh, of points, but uh, if they're after uh, a week or so of gonadotrophin stimulation, you see that nothing is uh, moving in terms of uh, uh, follicle development, estradiol levels. You may stop the stimulation, but you don't have to cancel the cycle because if the patient are not doing well on the stimulation, paradoxically, once you stop the stimulation, they will develop a follicle and sometimes two follicle. So you don't need to cancel. You may um, convert this cycle into a natural or a modified natural cycle. But uh, about a week or so uh, would be enough to make a decision about the response. Let me add to this question another question. Is there any dose limit, higher dose limit, that you will not add more gonadotrophin on a daily basis? What actually your highest dose, the gonadotrophin that you are giving to these patients? Well, especially patients with advanced maternal age and those with the low ovarian uh, reserve uh, often do not benefit from an increased dose. And uh, a dose, uh, a maximal dose should be 300. Sometimes we get up to 450, never above it. 
but uh, many of the, these patients uh, enjoy and perform better on a minimal stimulation uh, uh, with even a lower dose of 150 or so. Do you think there should be a limit to the dose of gonadotrophin, total dose of units that should be given to a patient in a specific cycle? Uh, well, I, I don't think there should be a, a limit. I think you should be uh, uh, watching what's happening and, and make uh, an informed decision uh, with the patient about uh, how long to do the stimulation, how much money to spend on gonadotrophins, which are so uh, expensive. Um, but uh, I, I don't think uh, I could I could uh, uh, be specific about a certain limit. It, it is individual. And the last question, Ariel, which is coming coming from Peru. If we can use antagonist, which protocol do you suggest to use? So uh, in patients. Uh, with a low viral reserve and, and advanced maternal age, we would use a flexible uh, uh, antagonist protocol, meaning that we introduce the antagonist according to the patient's response. If they don't respond, then there is no, if it, if it takes time for them to respond, there, there's no benefit of using a fixed protocol and starting the antagonist before you see follicles uh, developing. So it is a flexible um, uh, protocol, and uh, we trigger relatively early at uh, 15, 16, 17 millimeters in, in such cases. Ariel, really thank you very much for willing to come back to this session of questions and answers. And we appreciate your support of this program. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, okay, we're here today, you know, and we're very lucky and happy to have uh, Professor Filippo Ubaldi here. Uh, he has given a lecture on dual stimulation in our online congress, and here he has graciously agreed to answer questions uh, in this recorded session. How are you, Filippo? Very good, thank you. And thank you again, and congratulations for the success of the, of the meeting. It was a planetary, planetary success. Would you mind giving a short conclusion uh, a summary of your talk first, and then we'll go to the questions. Sure, with pleasure. So from, from my talk, that we could see that there is the evidence that the multiple follicular waves that there are in, within one ovarian cycle allows to retrieve more oocytes, more competent oocytes per ovarian cycle. And the oocytes that are collected from uh, the second stimulation, let's go from the luteal stimulation, then these oocytes have been demonstrated that they have a competence which is at least as good as the oocytes coming from the follicular phase stimulation. So if we collect the oocytes from the follicular phase and from the luteal phase, we will increase the chance per ovarian cycle to obtain a euploid blastophys to transfer. And from my lecture, you, you could see that uh, in that difficult group of patients, the chance to have a, the chance to have a, a transfer of one euploid blastophys is about 40% from uh, 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 all coming from the follicular phase. And then if you consider all side coming from the follicular phase and all side coming from the luteal phase, the chance to have a euploid blastosis, so per ovarian cycle, it rises to 65%. So this is a strategy to try to increase the chance to have a transfer for women that are with reduced ovarian reserve or with advanced maternal age with a reduced chance to have an implant blastosis. 
Wonderful, thank you. Now, um, we have a, a bunch of questions, you know, that the audience have forward to us to ask you. And I suppose, you know, the first one, you know, after I collated them, the first one we should really talk about is, what is what are the patients that you would decide to do a dual stimulation? Or you know, which one is going to do one, which one is going to do two? Okay. So uh, at the beginning, in the uh, also in the in the in the study group of Huang with the Shanghai Protocol, at the beginning we used and also uh, the, the Shanghai Protocol used uh, the candidates for the double stimulation, uh, where the patients and are still the majority of them are those patients with reduced ovarian reserve. So those patients that have an anthropic follicle count of uh, three, four. Uh, two follicles, uh, five follicles, and especially if they are with an advanced maternal age, then those patients could be the candidates to have a, a dual stimulation. But then with the, with the increasing of the number, with the increasing of the experience, we modified the indications of uh, the dual stimulation, not according to the ultra follicle count, but according to the number of blastocysts that we obtain after the first stimulation, and according to the number of blastocysts correlated to the, age of, to the age of the patient. What does it mean? For instance, we have a woman of, uh, let's say, 33 years old. At 33 years old, the euploidy rate is 60%. So this patient is full responder has four anthropological counts. So this patient should be a candidate for a dual stimulation. But imagine that these patients with four follicles, she will end up with uh, four oocytes. And these four oocytes, after insemination, will end up with two blastocysts. So since the employee rate of this patient is 60%, the chance that in those two blastocysts, there will be the euploid one, will be very high. So either you test or you don't test, these patients can try to transfer the embryos without doing the second stimulation. So although at the beginning, these patients should have been a candidate for the dual stimulation, after the culture and after the um, obtaining of the blastocyst, since she obtained two blastocysts, then there's not need to go for the dual stimulation. But let's see the opposite case. The opposite case is a woman of 40 with a normal ovarian reserve with 10 follicles. The woman of 40 has a 25% chance of to have a euploid blastocyst. Euploid rate is 25%. So this woman of 40, she has 10 oocytes, but for this different reason, she ends up with two blastocysts. So the chance of having a euploid blastocyst there is very poor. So this patient can start a second stimulation to increase the chance to have at least four or five blood processes and to have a higher chance to find the blood one. So the indication, of course, I said the two opposites, eh? the two extreme cases, but the indication today is, of course, the ovarian reserve and the age of the woman. But the final, the final decision whether to start or not the second simulation, it will depend on the number of processes according to the age of the woman. Uh, thank you very much. Okay, now there's a question that asks, if you stimulate the final stage with an agonist, why don't you, in, why don't you just go with gonadotropin all the time instead of an agonist? Because, because we, of course, we, when we started, we did not know when to 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 start the second stimulation, and then we started that we, we we started starting the second stimulation 
after one day, two days, three days, four days, five days. And then we said that if we started the day after the Osai retrieval, nothing happens until the corporal Lutea will undergo a, a demise. So when when I've when I've been disappeared. So if you start on the second day of the of uh, uh, the Osai retrieval, you can start, but then you will administer chromotropins without um, great efficacy because the, the second fork of follicles will start to grow when the corporal nuclear of the first stimulation will demise. And this is the reason why we use to trigger with the agonist and not with the with the ACG. Because if you trigger with the ACG, you will keep on the life of corporal nuclear longer and then the stimulation will be longer. Reason is that, as, as I said before, we want to wait the obtainment of the blastocyst and then to decide whether to start or not in the second stimulation. Thank you. Now, is the second stimulation the Uzda is always better and more in number than the first stimulation? Um, in the big numbers, there's a significantly higher number of the number of the oocyte retrieved. So there's a significantly higher number of oocyte, significantly higher number of metaphysic oocyte, significantly higher number of blastocysts. And uh, so uh, if we take big numbers, we will have at the end of the day higher number of oocytes and therefore higher number of blastocysts. Okay? But uh, there are some cycles where the number of oocytes is higher in the follicular phase and not in the luteal phase. Let's say that in the 70% of uh, cycles, the number of oocytes retrieved is higher in the luteal phase than in the follicular phase. And of oh. course, and of course, we cannot say before or hence, which will be the cycle where the oocyte will be higher in the follicular phase or in the luteal. But overall, the number of that three is higher in the in the in the luteal phase. Among the poor response patients, is there a particular group that will benefit more? Is it uh, would do? Is it you know just poor responder by history, or poor responder during the first stimulation, or? Would you? Would there be any um, decision on your part? You know, any factor that make you decide to plan a second stimulation based on the number of small follicles available in the first stimulation? No, uh, uh, absolutely, because the small number of follicles available in the in the in the first stimulation, very likely there are not those that will be recruited. So it, it, it is not dependent on the number of those follicles because uh, we puncture also follicles of 11, 12 millimeters. So it, it, it's not an issue of how many follicles left after the first oocyte retrieval uh, will, will be available in the second in the second stimulation. So I told you the decision uh, when uh, to start is basically uh, um, determined by the criteria that I told you before. The number of those of the of the oocyte, but most the number of blastocysts that we can obtain uh, after the first stimulation, and the age of the woman, of course. Okay, and one very practical um, clinical question: um, as you know, you know the uh, with the Shanghai, and then after the Shanghai uh, Dr. Kwong's protocol, there's been a lot of different you know adjustments and uh, modifications of the dual stimulation. Now, um, in your case, when when is the day that you will start the second stimulation? Is there any is there any indication by hormone, by uh, follicular size, or anything that you decide to change your date? No. There's not any indication because you cannot it cannot be indicated on the follicles, on the corpora lutea. Uh, on the uh, on the hormones, you should not see a patient when you start the second stimulation because 
so it will be a mess. And you should do the first ultrasound after six days of stimulation. So we started, we started, we decided to start on day five for these two reasons that I told you before. The first one is uh, that that uh, experimentally we observed that uh, if you start before, it's useless to administer uh, gonadotropins because the follicles, will, the new follicles, will not grow until there are the corpora lubia. And the second reason uh, is because we want to weight the number of blastoses that are obtained. Would you would you check the hormone levels, FSH average, and progesterone before you start the second stimulation? Never. 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 It's okay. completely That sounds wonderful. Now, someone asked if you can only use, if you only stimulate, you only have one stimulation cycle for this um, poor response patients. Would you do it in the luteal phase or would you do it in the follicular phase? So if I if I if I can choose only one, I would choose the luteal stimulation. Okay. So you wait till the the first batch. Uh, normally, normally wait until uh, when we start the the luteal stimulation, the first stimulation. We, we start around day 17, day 17, day 18. It depends on the length of the of the study. Okay. Well, you know, there's one last question, you know, is uh, talking about insurance, you know, is whether there's cover. Would you know whether or not the insurance or, you know, say, for instance, in countries that will pay for uh, IVF cycles, would uh, they pay for... But will this count as two cycles or just one cycle? We we charge one cycle and a half. <laughs> Wonderful. We charge, we charge one cycle and a half. No, but but this is something that uh, a friend, a colleague friend of mine reported. Uh, in in France, uh, they charge the cycle. And not per entire three months. So they in France they do a lot of one and a half cycles. They do a lot of dual okay. stimulation, and then the reverse is whatever you do in the ovarian cycle. So they 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 had they they, they found this uh, uh, this uh, way of uh, the way this way out. But in the private we work in the private basis. In the private we charge the dual stimulation at one point five. Well, I guess, you know, there's an uh, answer very, very clearly, and uh, the, I, I hope, you know, it will also satisfy all the, all the people who have sent in questions. You know, I, you know, definitely, you know, have uh, learned again, you know, and confirmed some of the thoughts, you know, that's in my mind about stew stimulation, and uh, thank you very much. Milton, hey, Seth, before, you have anything before you finish, before you finish, I have a question to both of you because yeah. we, we are doing quite a lot of uh, double stimulation cycles, mainly in poor responder patients. And while you gave the talk, we thought that the better, the better part of the stimulation is during the luteal phase. And we thought that because we stimulate during the follicular phase and we are not aspirating all the small follicles, so during the second stimulation, these small follicles that we are started to grow, but we didn't finish to grow them up with the addition of gonadotrophin, then will go up and give us a better results. But I want to ask you both, is it possible that the progesterone environment during the luteal phase make all these changes? That we get more oocytes, we get better oocytes during the luteal phase, maybe it's the progesterone, and not the previous stimulation during the luteal phase. Uh, the may I, phase sorry. Yes. Uh, I don't think that uh, the the oocyte, the follicles that we grow in the in the luteal phase, we are, are the small follicles that we didn't grow in the follicular phase. 
Uh, I think that there are new follicles. Uh, this is this is the reason why they start to grow when the corporal luteal is the mice. Okay. And uh, we we just published. I think it's a it's just it, it's just on PubMed yesterday or two days ago. And we did a, we, we we did the, some hypothesis uh, on why in the luteal phase. Uh, there are in the 70% of, of cases a higher number of follicles. And uh, this hypothesis is that uh, uh, maybe the priming of estradiol and gestion during the follicular phase uh, will allow a better uh, recruitment of the other follicles that will be that will be recruited. This is one reason. Another reason could be that the trigger can use the um, uh, factors that uh, uh, will uh, will help to a better recruitment of the second of the second phase. So there, it's not clear, but I don't think that the progesterone during the luteal phase will improve uh, the recruitment because the recruitment is something that starts before the of the secretion of progesterone of the luteal phase. And also the quality, it's not better the quality of the oocyte uh, in the luteal phase than in the follicular phase, and also the competence. The euploidy rate of the blastocysts in the luteal phase are identical at the, uh, at the blastocysts of the follicular phase. And also, and we, we, we have an over presentation yesterday now on the, on the outcome of babies born. There are more than 200 babies born uh, from the luteal phase and from the follicular phase. And there are absolutely no differences in the in the in the outcome in the obstetric outcome and the, in the in the outcome of these babies. So I think that there's no difference in the quality of the of the oocyte. It's not better. It's just a question that once one plus one makes two and gives higher chance per per ovarian cycle the time of obtaining an embryo that will give a life. So this is a strategy. This is nothing that improves the quality, or no, nothing that improves the uh, the employee rate. But this is a strategy to try to improve per time unit the chance to have at least one embryo for these patients that have a use that is available to have a life. Well, in uh, in in our um, in my experience. Sometimes um, the in the right after egg collection, the first batch collect egg collection, and then you see some follicles, but for, in the small number of uh, cases, these small follicles will become atritic. They come, they actually become smaller and smaller, and uh, so in this case. Would you just wait until you see a new bunch come up, or you give up the cycle and just um, uh, go along? You give up the cycle. After the osteotic trial, the first ultrasound is about 10, 11 days after. Okay, so the osteotic trial is the first of May. Then on the fifth, sixth of May, the start the stimulation. And then the first ultrasound is on the 10th, 11th of May. So I don't care on the, on the follicles that there are before the osteo retrieval, because those follicles will go, as you said, maybe to atresia. And Filippo, another question. Yeah. Yes, by, by your experience, in the original National High Protocol, they increased the number of gonadotrophin given to the patient uh, from the follicular phase to the luteal phase, approximately 75 units. Are you also increasing the dose in the luteal phase? No, because we give already the maximum dose, 300 international right. units plus 75, 150 of, of recovery at the least. So it's it's no use to increase. More than 300, more than 375 is completely useless. Okay, thank you. Milton, you want to conclude? Okay, well, thank you very much, you know, for uh, Professor Ubaldi, you know, for uh, joining us this evening and uh, 
graciously answer questions from our audiences, you know, and uh, so uh, from uh, the IVF Worldwide and CMU Congress team, Professor Soham and myself from Hong Kong, we thank you and uh, we'd like to see you again in future uh, webinars and congresses. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank, thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Hello, welcome again, you know, to our question and answer period. And uh, today, you know, we're very happy and honored to have Professor Arito Sand back with us to uh, graciously answer questions from our audience in the first online um, reproductive um, Congress, a CME Congress that a few days last Saturday. Now, um, Professor Sen, you know, we have a, a bunch of questions. Uh, more of them, you know, are more clinical, you know, and as you may expect, you know, from an, our audience. And uh, to start off with, you know, there's a whole lot of people who wants to know um, a pra very practical question, and that is, what is the dosage of androgens and also, how do you decide what dosage to use? Yeah, so so the question is, so the other way it can be like, you know, what is the normal level or what is the threshold of androgen and how to do it? So the answer to this question is that we don't know yet because this is a very um, a young area of research. It's just about 10 years that we are looking into it. And this answer basically needs to come from the clinic. Because when we have a large uh, data set of patient androgen levels and their history, then only we can correlate the androgen levels with their fertility and symptoms. The other way of doing it is that, you know, relate the androgen dosage with respect to antral follicle count. You're giving a dose and then me measuring the antral follicle count and that's how you adjust the dose. But it's a very difficult question and the jury is still out there because we don't have that large data set where we can compare and do a correlative or meta-analysis study for that. Okay, so since, you know, we don't really, you know, have uh, any fixed, you know, threshold that mm -hmm. we can measure, uh, do we need to decide on the dosage uh, only on the experience or just, uh, you know, uh, empirical? Now, the question, um, audience ask then will be do you need to monitor uh, the androgen level once you start yes yes and, the, and what do you measure right so definitely you have to measure androgen level but there are different types of androgens right so this so in my opinion or my again i'm not a clinician but what i feel like is that you first, before you start the doses and all, you have to measure different forms of androgen to get an overall picture to see where the patient is with the androgen levels. Now, measuring that will also tell us if there is a problem of enzymatic conversion. You know, so that's what you have to do initially. But then measuring the endpoint, it depends on what type of androgen you're giving. Some people give testosterone. Now, if you're giving testosterone, then measuring the total testosterone is fine. But if you're giving DHEA, then you need to measure androstene dion and total testosterone. So depending on what form of androgen is gi you're giving and where it lies in the steroidogenic pathway, you need to measure that. But you have to have a, as like initially when you are starting, you need to measure different forms to see where it is. Because you might see high level of androstene dion, but then when you're in a patient before you start, but when you're give, measuring total testosterone or testosterone, it might be low. That will tell you that there might be a problem with the person with enzymatic conversion. So you cannot give that person DHEA, but probably total testosterone will work better because it's way lower in the steroidogenic pathway. Yeah. So now the different forms of testosterone, you know, the, the most common form uh, is actually probably DHEA, as you know, right. it was elucidated, you know, for in our conference. Right. Uh, 
uh, uh, one of the speakers said, you know, perhaps up to you know 60% of uh, our infertile patients are already taking DHA. Now, but of course, you know, there is a testosterone cream uh, mm -hmm. or gel, and right. also the patch. So you're saying that if we use DHA, you know, we should follow and monitor by androgen down and also test the total testosterone. And if we use testosterone patch or gel, then we should measure um, testosterone, total testosterone, maybe even free testosterone right. and uh, and uh, sex hormone binding globally. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Okay, so then of course, you know, then actually there's a question say, Professor said, is there a dangerous level? Yes, yes, there is, because people will have hyperandrogenic conditions, right? Because as, as I mentioned in my uh, talk, that balance is the key, and then you have hyperandrogenic condition, and you'll develop, you know, PCOS-like characters, hirsutism, and stuff, stuff like that. So that's what I said that we need. And again, it, this level varies from patient to patient. So you need to not only monitor antral follicle count, but you also have to monitor the symptoms and see what it is. So it's a balance and again it's not one size fits all so that is what it is this is where the precision medicine thing comes in right because it is very specific from person to person well okay you know of course you know but how about um there there has been you know uh, in the maybe in a few years ago people are saying you know that uh, maybe if the women taking the androgen supplement and they don't have any male or male changes you know then it'll be okay you know then uh, because i suppose you know what you have been saying is also true you know that male changes also varies from different people some people you know may have a very low level of testosterone supplement and yet they respond strongly so right. anyway so i guess the answer if i may uh, conclude uh, for this few minutes is that you know we should uh, test and check for androgen levels before we start and also you know we should uh, monitor uh, in whatever way uh, that we want that we don't want to uh, cause any side effects right so the second uh, part is you know people say actually you know this is something you know that uh, that i also myself would like to have a little bit of ex uh, appreciate explanation in physiology and, and biochemistry. You know, there, 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 are, there are situations when there's already hyperandrogenism. You know, so you know, like uh, PSOS, you know, like um, uh, or tumors, uh, androgen tumors. You know, like uh, drugs. You know, that uh, increase like letrozole. Right. So in instances, you know. Do we still need to add androgen or do we just use the laboratory test levels and reduce the androgen? Right. So in hyperandrogenic conditions, like you said, like, you know, PCOS, adrenal tumor, or sometimes like uh, congenital adrenal hyperplasia, where you have a problem with the adrenal at very high level of androgens. So in hyperandrogenic condition, it's a different, little bit different because then your neuroendocrine effect also comes in right because very high level of androgens can also have an effect on the brain and that also interferes with the whole ovulation the lh uh, uh, pulse and the uh, you know the lh surge and stuff like that in ovulation so that is the problem if you look at the ovary in a in hyperandrogenic conditions you already have these small antral or large antral follicles that assist the problem in hyperandrogenic condition is a little bit different because it is more of a neuroendocrine and there is a block. It's like the door is closed. You still have those follicles ready to ovulate, but the door is closed because there's no ovulation. And that is because of a neuroendocrine problem. So it won't help you to give more androgens, right? It, in that case, you have to lower it to let the door open, let them ovulate and restart the cycle. So it is, it's a completely different scenario because in the hyperandrogenic or PCOS condition, the, the neuroendocrine factor is very high. And we have seen this in knockout animals also, like 
you know, in my, I've shown different types of knockouts in my talk. In normal condition, when you knock the androgen receptor out in the granulosa cells, it mimics the global knockout. Like you have infertility, you have subfertility, infertility, premature ovarian failure. And, not, and androgen receptors in the brain or the pituitary is not involved that much. But in a hyperandrogenic conditions, there are other labs who have done it. That's when the androgen receptors in the brain or the pituitary comes into play. So that's what we are talking about. I hope that answers the question. Yeah, well, you know, then there's, um, the, there's uh, hyperandrogenism uh, causes multiple uh, or increase in number of follicles, usually. Yes, okay. so you have cysts, right? You have more cyst-like follicles and stuff like that. But you're, but it's also, since it's so high level of androgen, it's also having other effects. It's that's what I'm talking about, and and there is no ovulation also because these are on these patients or these animals. What we have also seen that they are anovulatory. Now, in so going to you know another you know so follow up you know on the effect you know in the treatment of infertility, does um, hyperandrogenism cause any? Uh, endoploidy in the uh, eggs, in the oocytes? Yeah, I, I haven't looked into it, so I, I'm not sure, but there is some data about it, but I'm not sure about this because uh, we haven't looked into the egg at all. But uh, androgen receptors, we we did a oocyte-specific androgen receptor knockout animal, and they were normal. So, but again, we were looking at the, the importance of androgen for normal follicular development, normal oocyte development. In hyper and we haven't looked into hyperandrogenic conditions, so it's a completely different condition. And to to be brief, I don't know. We haven't looked into it, and I don't know. Okay, so there's something that you know maybe someone you know who's interested right. you know can follow up on. And uh, but more in most cases, in most cases that you know we give androgen uh, for uh, poor re ovarian response, you know, or poor ovarian reserve. You know, I doubt if ever, you know, we would be causing hyperandrogenism right. in most cases. Right. Uh, so, so maybe, you know, there's something that I hope, you know, maybe, uh, maybe you would look into too, Professor Sen, you know, that, because I think it definitely will help. But of mm -hmm. course, you know, uh, in children, you know, that are born, you know, from subfertility and having had uh, supplement, you know, we don't see any increase chance of any uh, of uh, of uh, abnormal you know chromosome babies but at, but then you know do you know have you ever heard of any study that in because now you know, pgt uh, s is uh, very popular you know whether you know that would, there will be an increased chance or increased endoploidy chance i don't know i'm not aware of it i i i don't know to answer the question i don't know this to be honest so it means clinically, you know, we can be quite sure, you know, that uh, androgen replacement or supplement may be quite safe, as 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 we we'll know the signs. Yeah, like I can give you the molecular insight and how androgen is working, but the clinical aspect, whether it's safe or not, that's more for the clinicians to figure that out. <laughs> <laughs> because I'm a basic scientist, so I'm, I'm 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 giving you how androgen is working because what happened was few years back, there were a lot of this data that was coming out from the clinic, seeing a positive effect of androgens, but nothing was known about how androgen is working and stuff like that. So my, my research provides a molecular insight or a molecular explanation of what is actually androgen doing in the ovary. Right. So uh, there's one more question, you know, so it says, um, uh, and pre, are preandro follicles sensitive to yeah. um, FSH and does androgen changes this uh, sensitivity? Right. So, so, so the thing is, uh, I've been using this uh, term preandro in a very broad sense to make it easy to comprehend. But definitely, like you know, primordial, primary, or small secondary follicles are usually not sensitive to FSH. What I'm talking about sensitivity, it's these, these large 
secondary follicles that are about to develop an antral antrum or a small antral follicle. So that is what I'm talking about. And what androgens are doing is exactly what you said. It's inducing FSH receptors to make them sensitive. So that is what's pushing these large preantral follicles to the antral stage. So that's what, if, you, if, we, if we don't give androgens or if we get rid of androgens, then this whole process slows down. So that's what I'm talking about. So I'm not talking about primordial or primary or small secondary follicles. I'm talking about these large secondary follicles that are about to transition to small antral follicles. Oh, thank you very much. And uh, thank you very much again you know, for joining us. You know, I think you know, a lot of your, your answers would have helped a lot of clinicians, you know, that are either using too much, too little. But, you know, I, I appreciate, you know, your uh, advice, you know, that people should um, have a pre-testing to, to determine whether someone really needs it and maybe you know also some type of monitoring seth Thank any you. comment seth yes just before you leave this the scene uh, i have a question for Arito, which came from colombia and i think it's quite interesting from a uh, duarte jorgen and actually they ask uh androgen have the same action in all mammals ovary yeah it, it as long as I, I, like between humans and mice, it does. It more or less, like molecular mechanism wise, it does. So that is what we have seen. We have looked into in mice. Uh, there are a lot of data out there in porcine, in bovine. People have looked and they have seen very similar effects as in humans. So androgens, like if the basic molecular mechanism is very similar. It's very conserved. Right. Okay. The, down, the, the, down, yeah. the downstream effect or the gene, the specific genes might be different, but the molecular mechanism is very similar. Right. Okay. Uh, Milton, you want to yeah. say something? Because oh, well, I just thank you again, Professor Sam. You know, thank you, Seth, and uh, thank you for um, the audience attendees that have sent in questions. You know, I think that's a very good response to our meeting. We are, we are very happy and glad to have Norbert Gleicher from New York again with us to answer lots of questions that arrived following his presentation at the Congress. Uh, hello, Norbert. Hi, Zen. Before we go into the questions, can I ask you to summarize your talk in a few sentences? Yeah, uh, of course. Um, so my talk was principally about androgen supplementation and androgen supplementation uh, by a DHA rather than testosterone. Uh, and it can be summarized uh, by saying that like any medication, uh, supplementation uh, or treatment with a particular medication requires an underlying cause. In other words, uh, women should not be supplemented with androgens unless they are high androgenic, meaning have relatively low androgens. Um, and that applies to, in principle now, three infertility groups, women with low functional ovarian reserve, either due to advanced uh, female age or due to what is called premature ovarian aging or also called occult primary ovarian insufficiency. Secondly, a condition which we first described a number of years ago uh, and which we are calling the hypoandrogenic PCOS phenotype-like syndrome uh, because it is like the under Rotterdam criteria uh, phenotype D, a skinny lean PCOS phenotype, which with advancing age goes from being hyperandrogenic to hyper androgenic and finally there's a small group of women who present with a picture of basically primary ovarian insufficiency early menopause but 
who actually have what we now call secondary menopause or secondary ovarian insufficiency due to insufficiency in adrenal androgen production at extreme levels. Uh, and this is the combining link. Uh, what we have learned over the years is that women who have low androgens usually have low androgens because their adrenal production is deficient, not their ovarian production. And this is very important because if the ovarian production by theca cells is deficient, that ovary is burned out and all the androgen supplementation in the world will not help. But if it is the adrenal contribution to the woman's androgen levels, then supplementation obviously makes sense. And since we now know that ovaries need good androgen levels, that will kind of reawaken ovarian function and you will be successful. And I'm sure we will talk more about how to do that androgen supplementation in the question and answer session now. Thank you, Norbert. There were many questions, so I tried to group them into different topics. And I would like to start with the questions about the safety, safety of administration of DHEA. And there are questions from Armenia, India, Germany, United Kingdom, Philippines, and Saudi Arabia. And I'll read the questions, and then you will try to approach all the topics together. So the questions are, if patients doesn't know that she is pregnant and continue DHEA, is it toxic for pregnancy? Then can DHEA be teratogenic? Are there adverse effects of androgen like DHEA? Is there anything to consider for patients counseling? Any serious side effects? Is a controlling drug in the United Kingdom now and why? At this dose, 35 milligram three times a day, do many patients complain of hyperandrogenism, acne, hirsutism, etc.? Or is DHEA affect the embryo? So I think this is cover patients, embryo, and treatment. So can you elaborate a little bit more about this? Yeah. Yeah, and, and I think uh, I, I can give you uh, very uh, responsive answers to all of this. First of all, it is most important to recognize that DHEA is what is called the natural hormone. In other words, it is a hormone that our bodies are producing. And that already means something about its potential side effects. It's not the new mo molecule uh, that the body for the first time sees. So in general, natural hormones have very few side effects unless you, you give it in huge dosages. The dosage of DHA that we usually prescribe, which on the average is 25 milligrams three times a day, is roughly the daily production dose, uh, the, the daily production of DHA by, by an adult individual. So it's a relatively low dose, and you cannot compare it to the dosages that athletes are taking who want to abuse DHA, bodybuilders, for example. They are taking 20, uh, 30 times uh, those dosages a day. The dosages that, that we prescribe for 25 milligrams three times a day is a very, very safe dosage with very few side effects. Indeed, the most frequent side effect uh, we hear is that patients uh, feel more energetic, particularly if they were severely hypoandrogenic, and they also usually, in those cases, report much better libido after the testosterone levels rise. Uh, and uh, it is not a joke, but sometimes we have a hard time convincing our patients, once they do get pregnant, to stop taking the DHA. Uh, because they feel so much more vigorous uh, and better with the DHA. Uh, which brings me to a second important point, and that is that the placenta is a DHEA factory, and that answers all the questions about concerns in pregnancy. The dosage of DHEA that we give 
in our fertility treatments uh, results in much lower DHA levels than uh, a pregnancy, simply uh, the production rate of the placenta. So uh, there, there really is no concern in pregnancy. And if a patient gets pregnant and doesn't know about it, it's, it's not tragic. You just stop the DHEA uh, once the pregnancy uh, is recognized. There, is, there are no teratogenic effects um, reported from DHEA to, to the best uh, of, of my knowledge. And frankly, I wouldn't expect them because, as I said, the placenta is a DHA factory. Now, one more uh, and maybe uh, the most important point. There is a reason why we give DHEA to our patients in order to raise the testosterone levels rather than testosterone. And I'm getting very often the question from colleagues and patients, why not take testosterone directly? And the answer is, is very important. If we give testosterone to a patient, we are flooding her whole body with the same level of testosterone. But the testosterone levels in our organs are not the same in all the different organs. The ovaries have different testosterone levels from the liver. And the reason is that our organs, our periphery, makes androgens from its precursors. And DHA and DHAS are the principal precursors of testosterone. So when we give DHA, we are basically following the physiology of the body. And every organ will take only as much precursor as it needs to get to the levels that that organ desires. And this is important because for this reason, it is almost impossible to overdose with DHEA. On the other hand, if you give testosterone directly, you may overdose. And getting into too high testosterone levels is almost worse than being in too low testosterone level. So have I answered all of the questions? Thank you. It was very important to start and first to understand that DHEA is basically a safe supplement. And now we have several questions about the duration. I just read two of them coming from Nigeria and Armenia. And there is another one from Argentina. What is the minimum duration for supplementation with DHEA before starting a cycle? How long can you give DHEA? Yeah, both obviously important questions. Uh, the minimum du uh, duration of supplementation before I would take a patient into an IVF cycle is six to eight weeks. And uh, it is also important, again, to understand why that is. When we supplement low androgen levels, low testosterone levels, we are achieving a positive influence on follicle maturation at what is called the small growing follicle stages. Aritra Sen, in his talk uh, at the conference, uh, went into a lot of detail uh, in that regard. Those are the follicles uh, after recruitment until small antral stage. Uh, it is those early stages of follicle maturation where follicles need good testosterone levels in order to grow and to make good eggs. But that early stage of follicle development still requires at least six to eight weeks before these same follicles then reach gonadotropin dependency, and that is only the stage where they become responsive to the gonadotropins in an IVF cycle. So if we don't pre-treat for at least those six to eight weeks that it still takes for follicles to reach the gonadotropin dependent stages, 
we are achieving treatment, but we are achieving treatment of follicles that will only become available the month afterwards. So six to eight weeks must be the minimum time. How long can you be on DHA? Again, the dosages we, we are prescribing are basically physiological replacement dosages. And therefore, uh, we don't see a time limit uh, to their use. Uh, DHA is widely used uh, in other indications in medicine. And uh, in those indications, it is used for months and sometimes years, such as in rheumatology, such as in sexual medicine, uh, etc. So once again, I don't think that there needs to be much worry. One of the beautiful things about the HA is how limited its side effects are to maybe a little bit of oily skin, mild acne, rare instances, hair loss, nothing really uh, of, of, of any significance. Thank you. There are a few questions about, you know, people asking, <clears throat> is there any protocol to give DHEA? Is there any protocol in which you give DHEA and then you continue with IVF? Is there any protocol for IVF continue DHEA? So people would like to have like kind of a frame of treatment with DHEA and IVF. Is it, yeah. is it connected or? Can be separated. It's not only connected, but it is an absolutely essential question. Because you can reverse all the advantages that androgen supplementation with DHA can give you in an IVF cycle by stimulating the patient inappropriately. And therefore, I think uh, my, my concluding slide in my talk uh, indeed was what not to do in an IVF cycle. And I think there are a lot of things that you're not supposed to do and then there are a few things that we recommend that you do do uh, you are not supposed to use anything in a subsequent ivf cycle after you you supplement the patient with androgens that is suppressive to ovaries why would you suppress ovaries in a woman who already has suppressed ovaries and that's why we supplement with androgens so what that means for us is no pretreatment with oral contraceptives or any other hormonal contraceptives, no antagonists, and no long agonists. Our routine uh, stimulation protocol uh, is in young patients with low functional ovarian reserve, a microdose agonist protocol with max stimulation uh, by gonadotropins. Uh, and in um, older patients or in patients with extremely low ovarian reserve, it is what we call our HERE protocol, H-I-E-R, highly individualized uh, egg retrieval. Uh, and what we mean by that is um, that the older the ovaries are, either because of female's age or because of premature ovarian aging, the older ovaries are, the earlier the eggs need to be retrieved. And uh, in this context, I always mention the fact that I think our center currently holds the world record uh, for the oldest woman conceiving and having a child with use of her own eggs at age 48. And in that patient, we triggered with HCG when her leaf follicle size was only 12 millimeters. So the older the ovaries, the earlier we need to take out the eggs because uh, what uh, some of our colleagues in the lab a number of years demonstrated and published, um, as uh, ovaries age, the processes inside the follicle speed up. And so if we wait in older ovaries as long to retrieve as we do in younger ovaries, we get what we call overcooked hard boiled eggs, jokingly speaking, 
rather than soft boiled eggs. And so the older the ovaries, the earlier we will take them out. And therefore, how you manage your IVF cycle is of crucial importance even after you prepare the ovaries, or maybe especially if you prepare the ovaries. Norbert, I want to approach you with another three questions. Came from Rajan Hamashi from Singapore, Mazur Zeba from Pakistan, and Mura Konashu from the United Kingdom. And they wrote like this. Do you measure the testosterone at a specific time of the cycle? Do all women who need infertility treatment need the baseline androgen workup, or there is a definitive criteria? And the last one, do you use the existing reference ranges for the androgen level to determine low or normal levels, or have you set different levels to decide when uh, you prescribe DHEA? Once again, all very, very good questions. Um, we started out uh, supplementing uh, with DHEA. Uh, it's now 15 or so years ago, really without understanding uh, why we were doing it. We, we, we discovered that it worked, but we didn't understand why we did it. Once we recognized that uh, the underlying disease is low androgen, or low testosterone levels in the female, we started testing for it. And so I cannot sit here and tell you that everybody must have their testosterone, DHEA, and sex hormone binding globulin levels tested at baseline, but that's something that we have been doing now for close to a decade. So uh, from our point of view, yes, we do test uh, baseline androgen levels because we want to know where we started and where we end up before we start the IVF cycle. Secondly, a uh, very important question is, how do you define uh, hypoandrogenism in a patient? And that is a very difficult question to answer for one simple reason, and that is that there's probably no hormone group where testing, laboratory testing of levels is as undetermined as androgens, or at least there are not many groups where it is so difficult to interpret. And the reason is that there are so many different methodologies units, etc., in how all the different androgens, not only testosterone, are being tested. And therefore, I cannot sit here and tell you that there's a certain cutoff level uh, below which the patient is hypoandrogenic. Uh, in addition, uh, like many reproductive hormones, uh, what is a normal level changes with age. In other words, uh, what is a normal androgen level at age 43 is different from what is a normal androgen level uh, at, at 32. Uh, so how do we do it? How do we determine whether a patient uh, is hypoandrogenic or not? And, and I can only tell you how we do it and how we do it in our studies. Uh, we consider a patient to be hypoandrogenic if her testosterone or DHA or DHAS levels uh, fall into the lower third of normal range. And the rationale behind it is very simple. When you look, whatever laboratory you use, that laboratory will give you a normal range, but that normal range includes women of all ages, including women in menopause, who very frequently have almost no androgen. And therefore, since we are dealing with women who are premenopausal, uh, we consider that they need to be at least in the middle third of normal range. 
And if they fall into the lowest third of normal range, we consider them hypoandrogenic. It's an arbitrary definition, <clears throat> but it is a definition that statistically has proven itself in, in, in a lot of studies. Uh, and we also see that once we supplement with androgens, with DHA mostly, patients who were in the low third then go into usually the middle third, rarely higher than that, but sometimes they do that as well. And even more importantly, their sex hormone binding globulin comes down because sex hormone binding globulin goes into opposite direction from testosterone. And therefore, we use sex hormone binding globulin to help us determine whether a patient has reached uh, normal testosterone levels. And we want sex hormone binding globulin, if at all possible, to, to drop below 80. Those are the, the values that we use. Thank you. There is, I think, a very important question here coming from Matar. Norodin from Morocco. And this is based, well, the question is, what are your results about use androgen in case of premature ovarian failure or premature ovarian reserve or ovarian reserve deficiency? And I know that you have a lot of patients over the age of 40 with low ovarian reserve. So can you summarize for us, you know, the results in this group of patients using DHEA as you have a lot of experience with this. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, first of all, um, the question itself uh, demonstrates a very important issue, which I kind of mentioned in my introduction uh, to the conference. Um, the importance of being accurate in your terminology. Uh, the person who is asking this question asks the effects of DHA on premature menopause pri or primary uh, ovarian insufficiency, and then uh, at the same in the same sentence on uh, low ovarian reserve. And it is obviously important to understand that there are distinct differences. The lower the ovarian reserve, and early menopause is obviously the ultimate low ovarian reserve, uh, the lower the ovarian reserve, the less effective will androgen supplementation, DHA supplementation be. Uh, for example, uh, we many, many years ago in a study uh, very clearly demonstrated that in contrast to FSH, AMH values nicely increase on average after DHEA supplementation. Uh, and that makes sense because AMH is produced by granulosa cells of growing follicles. And so if, if you get more follicles to grow, your AMH uh, will go up. FSH does not demonstrate this with the same regularity. Uh, but we also showed in that study that that increase in AMH was much more significant in younger patients than in older patients. And again, that makes obviously sense. Everything is better in younger patients. Uh, and as you and I know, everything gets worse as we get older. Um, that applies uh, also to the efficiency uh, of, of DHEA. Overall, I can tell you that if you have a patient with low ovarian reserve, and if you find that she is hypoandrogenic, whatever she did in her prior IVF cycles will improve if you raise her androgen level. You will get more eggs and more importantly, better eggs. And therefore you will get better pregnancy, uh, better embryos, better pregnancy rates, lower miscarriage rates. So it's all relative. 
uh, nothing works in everybody. Nothing works in everybody in the same way. Uh, but you will see that if you select your patients correctly, uh, you don't have to do studies to see the difference. As a clinician, you will notice it right away. <clears throat> there are two questions here, taking us a little bit out from a productive medicine, but I need to ask you. One is coming from Take Hala from Saudi Arabia, and they ask, hyposexual male can take DHEA to increase libido? And the second one, coming from Romania by Denise Marina, do you recommend DHEA in menopausal women? So once again, interesting questions. Uh, let me start with the women question because we have experience uh, on that subject. Um, first of all, at least in the US, there's at least one product, one DHA product approved by the FDA for use in postmenopausal women uh, for vaginal dryness. Um, so this is an FDA approved commercial uh, product that is filled by prescription. And that is important to know this because DHA in general in the US is considered the food supplement. And so we have this paradoxical situation here that uh, you can <clears throat> buy DHA in anywhere and there are probably hundreds of brands of DHA out there, uh, unfortunately, with very different quality. But one company went through the costs of going through the FDA approval process because they wanted to be approved to a specific clinical indication and they were approved, as I said, for treatment of postmenopausal dry vagina. Uh, besides that, uh, because DHEA, uh, to a small degree, uh, is also converted to estrogen, uh, it has been for quite a while used uh, in some postmenopausal women and has been found uh, to show certain degrees of effectiveness depending on what symptoms uh, were investigated. We published, I think it is now about uh, two years ago, a study uh, where we tested uh, libido or certain aspects of female libido of the DHA use. And it is important to understand why we did it. We did it because uh, we sometimes, as I already said earlier, have difficulty convincing patients to stop taking their DHA once they get pregnant because they they experience the better energy levels and much better sex drive uh, if they were very hypoandrogenic from raising their testosterone because it has obviously been known for a long time that testosterone levels in women directly relate to their sex drive. And so uh, they felt so much better on the DHEA supplementation, which they got for fertility purposes, that once they got pregnant, they were hesitant of coming off of that supplementation. That led us to study this. Uh, we took patients who came to us for infertility and who we, because of their age or because of their low ovarian reserve, had to put on DHEA. And we gave them one of those uh, questionnaires uh, that is uh, standardized and is widely used in sexual medicine and asked them uh, to, to answer the questions in that questionnaire prior to taking DHA and then again six weeks or more after. Uh, and we didn't tell them even why we were doing that. We told them it was a study, but we didn't want to, to, to point them towards certain answers. Um, and the findings were remarkable because what we found is in, in almost every aspect uh, of uh, sexuality, we found improvements, even an improvement in, in, in pelvic pain in, patients who likely had endometriosis. 
obviously different degrees for different aspects. Uh, but overall, a remarkable improvement within six weeks of starting to take uh, DHEA. And these improvements were directly correlated to, the, to their starting testosterone levels. So um, DHEA uh, clearly uh, has an effect on sexual well-being in women, even premenopausally, postmenopausally. That has been known for a long time, but premenopausal it was never recorded, and we until we published this paper. Now, um, you also asked about men, and I had to raise my arms and say I really have no idea because this is something we have we have not uh, uh, investigated. But uh, giving men DHA, I would be very careful, particularly within an infertility settlement. Uh, situation because uh, if you give a man the HA you're also raising his testosterone and uh, as our listeners will probably know raising testosterone can suppress sperm production so at least from a fertility standpoint I would be careful uh, as it comes to male libido I have to say I do not know the answer and I'm not aware uh, of any published studies in that regard. Thank you, Robert. And before we close this session of question and answer with you, I have one question from Israel, from Adrian Schulman, and he said, can you comment on the effect of different brands of DHEA? And I would like to add and to learn from your maybe experience or thought why it is being over the counter in the United States, while in Europe and Israel, you need a prescription. Can you just let us yeah. know? Yeah, in, in, in the US, it's over the counter. It's considered a food supplement uh, because of one of the political quirks. There was a very prominent senator who recently retired, uh, who probably got big donations from the, the supplement industry. Uh, and he passed a special law that declared DHA as the only hormone there is to be a food supplement. <laughs> that's uh, that's how it happened in the U.S. and it happened decades ago. This was a senator who has been in, in the Senate for many, many, many decades. Um, now, the fact that in the U.S. it is a food supplement uh, is 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 a problem because that means um, that the control over the product quality is very minimal. And uh, there are studies in the medical literature, in the US literature, that have shown that uh, lots of these DHA products that you can buy over the counter, you cannot really trust. Uh, not trusting concentration of medication in them, not trust impurity, uh, simply cannot trust. And therefore, uh, we have to be very cautious uh, in, in prescribing DHA because not every DHA is equal. Uh, this is different, for example, from CoQ10, where the quality is, is, is more equal. Um, now, uh, the reason why in other countries it is not sold over the counter is probably going to the other extreme. The reason is that, as I briefly mentioned before, uh, DHA has been abused mostly in sports uh, by bodybuilders and other athletes uh, who wanted to get the benefit of higher testosterone levels without many of the side effects. And those people have been taking DHA in huge quantities, much higher than the dosages that, that, that we describe. And if you do that, there can be medical side effects. There can be liver damage. There can be other things. And so because of this abuse by athletes in many countries, not only does DHA require a prescription, but it sometimes is actually a controlled substance. Uh, you need 
It's more than just a regular prescription. So that's the history uh, of it. No, but thank you very much. And it was extremely, I think, important and interesting. And I'm sure that we'll have a lot of questions after this question and answer session, and we will send it to you. So again, thank you very much for supporting this program. My pleasure. Always my pleasure. Bye, everybody. Hello, John. It's wonderful to have you back from Australia. Steve, and it's my pleasure to be here. <laughs> right. We have received a lot of questions following your presentation, and we decided to bring you back to try to answer some of the questions that received after the, uh, the presentation itself. And I will read the question to you, and let's run through it with the short answers. And the first question came from the United Kingdom. It was presented by Ajua Spana. And they ask, should we use a consent form? And what are the risks if taken in the few days in early pregnancy? OK, well, I still use a consent form. This arose when we started to do this work. We started to use growth hormone in 2005. And we wrote our first paper in 2010 following five years of work. At that time, the only study we could look at was that just published by Jean Tassaric. But this drug is firstly, it's off-label. And it's a hormone which carries a lot of legal restrictions. So um, both in the world of recreation and in the world of sport and the Olympic Committee will ban its use. But um, even if people are found to have growth hormone, uh, in their possession, it's almost like finding that they've got uh, methamphetamines, etc. So um, it is has carries various restrictions, and therefore I think it's only proper to have a consent form, and essentially that consent form should come out of ethical approval from the local ethics committee. Um, you do need to document a number of things, like the potential for side effects. I'm going to tell you that we have not seen any serious side effects in our studies. I've had some minor ones, which was the development of edema, uh, mainly in the hands, and uh, joint aches also in the small joints of the hands. But the, the two that we feared was uh, diabetes, and the other one was to stir up some latent cancers, particularly breast cancer, there might be a, a small nodule somewhere, but it, it might expand dramatically because growth hormone, by our understanding, links with metabolic disorder and it links uh, with cancer. So you do need to say that you are, need, you are wanting to be vigilant about this. So your patient does need to sign the form to say that you will be watching out for these conditions. So I want to go further with this safety issue and to ask you specifically more, are there specific contraindications that we have to take care of? And in general, there is another question, what would be, what should be the total dose given? How long can we give it? And you mentioned that you're giving two units, other people may be giving more units per day. So is there any higher level of growth hormone level, units that you are not due to give more than this? Look, that's, there's, there's three or four questions there, and uh, I, I would like to take you back a little bit on the history. <laughs> One of my slides showed the 42 studies that were had been published at, at the time that I prepared my talk. There's now uh, n nearly 50. And the dose that's been used of growth hormone is uh, one as low as half a unit a day, which and showed some benefit. And the other, uh, other one goes up to 16 units a day. My clinic right now uses only one unit per day, one unit. And that matches the four studies 
where women had pan hypopituitarism, they had no pituitary function at all, and no menstrual period, no cycle, uh, all their cycles had to be induced. But when growth hormone was introduced to those patients, they all got pregnant, it was 12 patients in all, and they all had a full term healthy baby. The total amount of growth hormone used in those women was one unit per day and it was used for three months. So that's sort of 90 days, maybe 100 days. I think that's the sort of maximum you would use, 90 to 100. Gives you everything you need in the fertility. Now the question, other question you came up with was the, can it, what about if you inadvertently give it and the woman is pregnant? Well, if you're dealing with patients who don't have any growth hormone, uh, there is a question that using it in the first few weeks of pregnancy is a good idea. Because what happens in pregnancy is that uh, woman, the pregnant, the placenta begins to produce its own growth hormone. It's a different variant. It differs by 13 amino acids from the pituitary growth hormone. But it is essential. We know that it's essential the development of the baby that the placenta produces that growth hormone. Now, uh, if in studies that have found that this growth hormone isn't being produced from the placenta, those babies do suffer from intrauterine growth retardation. So if I wanted to summarize that point, I would say, look, use the growth hormone. When I first started using it, we stopped at the trigger, but actually we now say to the patients, keep taking it till you finish the ampule, which is usually 15 days into the cycle. Um, we are contemplating the question whether it's, it could be used in pregnancy, but we have not, I've not used it yet. Uh, but I don't see that there's a danger. Um, so that, that part I would uh, say it's, it's fine. But there was another question in yours, and that is, uh, who should we not give it to? Well, at the moment, if women have underlying medical disorders such as diabetes, autoimmune disorders, hypertension, renal, hepatic or blood dyscrasias, our standard is to gain approval with an obstetric consult consultant physician, even just for IVF. We don't treat women with those conditions willy-nilly. We need approval because we need a physician to look after that preg a woman during her pregnancy. And sometimes it then arises, can we add in growth hormone if she's not uh, conceiving? And then the physician will sometimes give us approval. But there will be many cautions because it depends on their hepatic function, their uh, you know, blood uh, features, autoimmune disorders, etc. We will generally be cautioned and we generally av avoid growth hormone where there are underlying medical disorders. Thank you, John. This is actually answering a lot of questions that I have here. So we'll go forward. And there is a question from Brazil by Tomako Renaino, who asks, do you use IGF-1 to adjust the dose? OK, that is a very, very good question. Um, I, I've just written some points down here. Let me collect that. Now, <clears throat> we are measuring IGF-1 along with its main binding protein, IGF-BP3, and then we calculate the ratio, IG, uh, the binding protein over IGF-1. Firstly, what we've noticed uh, in our, I mean, I've been using this now for 15 years, and we've had three major reports, and just recently I've written some papers uh, for uh, Frontiers Endocrinology, which, uh, Relook at, at at the experience that we had with those three studies, and some of these questions that are being raised. So IGF studies are very active in my unit right now. When we measure the IGF one in assessment cycle, that is before any treatment of the patient, we've noticed that the uh, IGF one is fairly tight. That is the vast majority from the fifth to the 90th centile ranges between 20 and 30 nanomoles per liter. Now, that, but those numbers might not mean anything because standard reporting is nanograms per mil. 
And if you want to change the numbers, then you've got to multiply by 75.3 or something like that. It's, uh, it's, it's a bit difficult, but I'm using SI units, and the SI units show that the vast majority of our patients have an IGF level between 20 and 30. And at the mean, the median and the mean are at 25 nanomoles per litre. So the, uh, what we're looking at here is if the women are on the low side, what happens when we give them growth hormone? Yes, they actually virtually double. They will go from say 15 to 30 uh, within four weeks. So uh, that I'm putting together and there will be a publication on that uh, very soon because I've just about completed that work. If I look at the uh, IGF BPE, the binding protein, the levels are very tight. They don't actually change very much and giving the woman growth hormone doesn't change the binding protein. The only thing that changes is the IGF-1. So what happens then is that the ratio, which for most of our poor prognosis patients is up around eight to 10, it drops usually by half. So we get the levels down under six, preferably under five. If the level is under five, then that is a very normal level and you, we've cured her growth hormone deficiency. So there will be an argument for using uh, IGF-1 to see if you're getting the right response. That leads me on to some of the other questions here because you're also going to ask me, well, should you be giving more growth hormone for women with a high BMI? Well, we haven't done that. All, well, all I've got is clinical observations and our clinical observations differ from <clears throat> other observations that have been reported. So if I'm, I think, you know, when we're looking at our IVF spectrum, we've got young women with high antral follicle counts and they behave in a way that is special. And when our main worry is to try not to get ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome. And we are obsessed with the idea of keeping them slim because that's all the health issues as indicate a, low, a lower BMI is better. Can I tell you that with my poor prognosis patients, the ones that we're giving growth hormone to, we get the best results if they're in the higher BMI range, actually from 23 to 33, and the ones who are in the higher range actually conceive faster and, and better. So I don't have anything against high BMI in uh, women who are categorized as poor prognosis. I think they actually do better. Whether they need more, more growth hormone to, to launch them into pregnancy, we haven't seen this from a clinical perspective. But I think that the idea of measuring IGF-1 and the ratio as a measure of response might tell us another story. If somebody needs to do that study, we will get around to it, but it's not high on my priority right now. Thank you. We have a question here from Singapore. Do you supplement growth hormone for frozen cycles? Um, I thought about this question and there's, uh, there's two aspects to it. Uh, here I have fresh IVF versus frozen embryo. We believe the benefits of growth hormone cease once the oocyte is recovered. So giving growth hormone beyond that, I haven't got any data to say that's a good idea. However, there may be a role for growth hormone to improve endometrial receptivity. I can tell you there's a miserable amount of data out there because the studies haven't been done. And I asked some of the world experts on endometrial receptivity to write me a chapter and they said, oh, I can't do your chapter. Everything I know about it could be written on the back of a postage stamp. So I think we don't have enough information. But what I can say is that when we froze down embryos that had been generated in a growth hormone cycle, and then we transferred those in a frozen embryo cycle, we get the same implantation rate as for the young, good responder females. It's, it's strictly measured on the blastocyst uh, quality measurements. We've used Gardner uh, grading. 
And so we believe that the embryo has now re received its benefit from the growth hormone. But it is true that we might have a number of women who go through repetitive frozen embryo transfers without a pregnancy. And we, are, we would believe that maybe there's an endometrial problem there, and particularly if they have got thin endometrium or history of Asherman syndrome, uh, it may be that growth hormone could have a benefit there. We think that's possible, but the studies have not yet been done. But on a routine, once you've got the embryo in the freezer, generated under the influence of growth hormone, there's no, there's no value in adding growth hormone. Thank you. There is the last question here from Adrian Schulman from Israel. Do you see an increase in progesterone levels during growth hormone co-treatment, as you might see in some cases with DHEA? Okay, well, it's true. Uh, you know, following uh, Norbert Gleisch's reports, my facility developed DHEA trochets, not tablets, because we know that the first port of call from the tablets is the liver, and the liver destroys DHEA to a various degree. So these trochets, which are put under the tongue, are very effective. Um, and I've published a paper to show that when you give these trochets, the testosterone level goes up very significantly, the uh, aldosterone levels go up, the uh, free androgen index rises because the SHBG stays the same, and uh, DHEA sulfate increases. So there's a dramatic effect. And the only thing I regret in that study that I didn't measure the progesterones, I could have done, but we've discarded all those samples now. Um, however, when we use DHEA, even in my studies, we do find that if the woman takes it right up to the menstrual period that she's about to start IVF, progesterone levels are high. And we're often waiting for the progesterone levels to come down. And if women inadvertently, or you try and take uh, use the DHEA during the IVF cycle, progesterone levels will be up. And that's adverse for the embryo in that, if you transfer the embryo in that cycle. Can I tell you that there's a lot of change in ideas going on at the moment. And if you decide that you're not going to transfer a fresh embryo, then there probably is nothing wrong with keeping the, uh, or having elevated proj levels. And maybe Gleisch's work might say that, you know, keep the DHEA going. But in truth, DHEA will raise progesterone in the follicular phase. And it, to, and most of us, that's a problem. Uh, growth hormone does not does not influence progesterone levels one iota. So, but many patients are taking DHEA because they've arranged to take it themselves. So you've got to be very clear in your history and check with the patient, you know, I'm going to give you growth hormone. Uh, you must let me know if you're taking anything else. Most of them are taking CoQ10. They might even be on, um, uh, you know, various other, DHEA and maybe even melatonin that they've got from somewhere else because they heard that it was a good thing to do. But when you start combining it in growth hormone cycles, it simply mucks up your analysis of the cycle. Okay, you, so Tom. the answer was that growth hormone does not elevate progesterone. <laughs> right. Thank you, John. Um, yeah. Before we finish this session, in one of our background discussion, you mentioned to me the larondrophism and the okay. consequence of growth hormone treatment to this specific group of patients. I think it's very important information, so maybe you share it with the audience too, very briefly, what you mentioned to me before. Yeah, yeah. Okay, um, Professor Laron from uh, Tel Aviv uh, described um, a group of dwarfs who uh, are very special and unique because their dwarfism is not due to a lack of growth hormone, uh, but due to a defect in the growth hormone receptor. So uh, they have they produce normal levels of growth hormone, but they have very low levels of IGF-1 because IGF-1 is generated in the liver from growth hormone stimulating the liver through the receptors. Now, this, uh, these group of dwarfs are 
sort of readily treatable by um, IGF-1, but that's expensive. And the, the ones I was reading about who are living in Peru, there's quite a few families there, um, uh, they can't even afford to use IGF-1, so they stay as dwarfs. But what is interesting about them is that regardless of their diet, regardless of their diet, they can be eating sweet food every day, drinking gallons of milk, etc. They never get diabetes, like never. And uh, they don't get the metabolic syndrome. And not only that, the ones who live into late life never get cancer. They don't die of cancer. Now, the I mean, there are, there are other things that can affect them, so they're not living to be, you know, 150 years of age, but it's just that these two diseases don't occur. And yet in our advanced society, we these are the two main diseases, the metabolic syndrome associated with diabetes, particularly type 2, and the, um, uh, and the development of cancers, inevitable cancer. All of us poor men, some stage you're going to get prostate cancer if we live long enough. Our wives get breast cancer at a high rate, etc. So you can avoid that by taking growth hormone out of the picture. Interesting. So the current viewpoint from some of the uh, scientists is that, well, fertility is a trade-off against these diseases. So if you have um, Growth hormone improves your fertility, improves your strength and vitality, at least as a young person under the age of 50. But it may be the thing that you don't want as you get older. I know that there are some famous people, mainly from the Hollywood industry, who like to inject their growth hormone each day so they can stay uh, in, a, in a, an invigorated or youngish state. But that might be a false idea because, uh, like in, your, in, my, in our studies, we were very vigilant to look for a cancer and B, are we uh, breast exam? We made, it, we made it compulsory for all of our women to have a mammogram before starting. And uh, they have a, an annual breast examination in the clinic. And uh, we believe that these are sensitive areas to growth hormone. So, Good and bad. John, it was extremely interesting. I'm sure that people will benefit a lot from your lectures and these question and answer sessions. And I really thank you again for coming us back from Australia for this session. So thank Can you I very much. Can I add a point, Zev? Yes. Uh, uh, there, there, are, um, there was one other question that we didn't cover. Uh, and many people have noticed it. That is, if you look at the meta-analyses of today, they add, they show that there's an improved, uh, maybe sometimes egg number, but egg quality improves and embryo quality improves, but it doesn't always show an improvement in live birth rates. Why is that? Well, what I've tried to say at the talk was that growth hormone is not the solution for defects in your IVF system. The IVF systems in the most advanced places are moving towards freezing your best embryos at the blastocyst stage using good vitrification technique. And not every vitrification technique is ideal. It really has to be the Kuayama method or similar to that. And, and also to look at the women who you've already categorized as poor prognosis. It's not just that they have poor ovarian responders or have got a low antral follicle count or a low AMH, they are women in a category of low fertility and everything about their cycle is wrong. So when you are stimulating, you can't get away with the same stimulation as you give to your younger patients. When you trigger them, you can't get, even get away with the same trigger. We use either double trigger or a dual trigger, both combined GnRH agonist, etc. Our luteal phase is heavily uh, governed so that we reach progesterone levels between 60 and 100 nanomoles per litre, or if it's in a stimulated fresh cycle, even higher than that. 
we once a woman has her pregnancy diagnosed, we monitor the first eight or first seven weeks, eight weeks, and if if hormone levels drop below optimum, so for estrogen needs to be a thousand picomoles per liter or above, we add in we have pessaries that will do that. We add in a progesterone to keep the progesterone level above 60 nanomoles per liter, and so our pregnancies are getting through beyond the seven, eight week stage. If she starts bleeding in the pregnancy, our regimen has been to give her MPA, hydroxyprogesterone acetate. And uh, the evidence I have now is that MPA, and I know Grisinger with the diadrogesterone, these two progestogens are quite safe. Well, I could only really vouch for MPA because I've now got uh, 6,000 babies under MPA. And I can tell you that the abnormality rate is not increased. So what I'm saying is that if you manage your program vigorously, is devoted to these poor prognosis patients, you will improve the outcomes even before you start using growth hormone. Final thing I'd like to say is I'm very happy to send our recent uh, discussion papers, which cover a lot of these questions, uh, to anybody who emails to me. The email uh, easy to find, uh, you know, jaljovich at pivot.com.au, and I will send uh, I will send this question and answer session and also these papers to anybody who inquires. Thank, Thank you, you John. Thank you. It was really valuable to hear these answers too. Um, okay, so we'll meet you, you sometime in the near future, and thank you very much. Thank you. <clears throat> so, at the end of this meeting and this session of question and answer, I would like to thank my co-chairman, uh, Milton Leung from Hong Kong, and I would like to thank the participants, the speakers, and I hope that you enjoyed the meeting. The exhibition will remain open for the next couple of weeks, and you can visit the booth. There is a lot of interesting scientific material in the different booths, and I hope, and I'm sure that you will enjoy it. And uh, I hope that we will meet again in the next meeting, which we will have to decide when we will hold it and where. So again, thank you very much. Thank you, Milton. Would you like to say a few words before we separate and finish this meeting? Thank you, Seth. You know, I, I think, you know, the ladies and gentlemen, colleagues, you know, we are trying to, at this difficult time when all of us you know, are tied up in our home, uh, nicely to get ourselves, to keep ourselves safe. And, you know, we would like to tell you that uh, we would further do more of this because uh, there may be some time that we still be uh, socially, socially distancing ourselves. And lastly, I would like to remind you, I know this is not the most uh, recommended procedure, but please say, stay safe, wear a mask whenever you are in public places, and especially you know, in crowded places like tra public transport markets and uh, elevators. Thank you.